Hello, everyone. It's so great to have you here. Uh, whether it is morning, afternoon, evening, welcome. My name is Nora Benavidez. I am the director of US Free Expression Programs at PEN America, and we are so thrilled to have you today uh, for our webinar on using media literacy to combat election disinformation. This is a train the trainer workshop. It is 60 minutes. I will probably barely breathe, but we are just so thrilled to have you and we want to reserve as much time for some live questions as possible during this live recording. I want to make a note of just a few logistical items. First, the chat is always available if you want to share resources or thoughts. The Q&A function is actually for where you can drop in your questions and I will try to address those at the end of the workshop. Um, in addition, this will be recorded and it will be available for a limited time for those that could not make the live recording right now. And so we will make sure that anyone who is attending live or otherwise after the fact has all of our resources, uh, which I will get to. It is really exciting uh, to have you. You know, we, we didn't anticipate we would get such a wonderful and big turnout, but there are uh, a couple hundred of you. So say hi to each other, get to know each other. I hope that this is part of what you can feel is a little community of other educators and librarians excited about defending truth and being involved this election season. For our roadmap today, I want to begin with just a brief overview of PEN America's work on disinformation and media literacy. And then I want to talk about what's at stake this election season and the role of librarians, how we see librarians being what we often call ambassadors of truth. And then we're going to review the toolkit that PEN America has created on the basics of disinformation and then another very short primer toolkit on our media literacy curriculum. And that's really the heart of how we have built out this program, hoping to give people tools, whether they are voters, partners of ours in the media, librarians and educators, students, a wide array of constituents that we hope can use these skills to identify misleading content and then hopefully be one of the stop gaps to prevent its spread. And then finally, we're gonna to try to reserve as much time as possible for Q&A. I am always available. We will have our contact information at the end. And I just want to flag quickly, and I'll say a few times throughout the training, that part of what we're doing today is really just giving you the framework, the bones for this type of discussion in hopes that you will hold your own sessions in your communities with your patrons. And to that end, we have created a unique and very tailored toolkit for all of you. It is a resource packet to make use of as you see fit and to adapt what you've learned today in this workshop for your purposes. So you can take notes, but don't feel like this is the only time you'll get this information because you'll get it again after the workshop is over and we send you the packet. So to get started, I, you know, PEN America has been working on monitoring the effect and spread of disinformation since 2016. We have, as an organization, always worked at the intersection of literature and words and free expression. And we have always been worried about how words might be manipulated or used for political gain. And I feel like in the digital age, this issue of misleading content, of even propaganda, feels incredibly potent. And it's very insidious. And so we have taken a look at what this phenomenon really is and how it affects our democracy, how it affects the fabric of our society in two different research studies. The first was in 2017, Faking News, in which we examined the 2016 election and this new phenomenon that we were beginning to consider fake news, fraudulent news, disinformation, and the like. And then we re-examined the issue again in 2019 when we looked at the 2018 midterm elections. And some of our most basic conclusions really center on this notion of identifying what disinformation means. What is it? And so as we define it, as other experts define it, it is demonstrably false information that is presented as fact with the intention to deceive the public. 
Now, we want you to feel comfortable walking people through, pretend, potentially walking your patients through, through the different kinds of misleading content, because not everything now is hard stop disinformation. Disinformation is really created with that intent element to deceive. And frankly, so many of us often fall prey to sharing disinformation. But when we do, we're not sharing it with the intent usually to deceive others. And so it becomes misinformation. And that's an important distinction. But we want you to begin feeling comfortable with these definitions. And so over the course of the workshop, I'll continue reiterating the difference. And again, in your resource packets, you will have a lot of definitions of what different kinds of misleading content are. Now in 2016 and 2018, I think it's really useful just to uh, get a very brief 30,000 foot view understanding of what we have seen. And there are a few key things that we have been able to identify and monitor over the last several years. With the digital age and with the advent of all of us being online, I would say more than ever, we have seen a number of ways that actors, whether they are foreign or domestic, infiltrate both our news cycles and our social media feeds to stoke polarization. What we have seen is that foreign actors absolutely are involved with and inciting a kind of discord in our society, whether it is Russian actors, Chinese, Iranian, or other foreign actors, we have seen those types of bad actors launch and push disinformation campaigns not just with the goal of affecting or swaying our electoral results in 2016 and 2018. I think there's actually something more that we have seen, something uh, almost more disturbing. And that is that so many foreign actors, their campaigns to discredit our institutions are wearing away at the fabric of our own shared knowledge and our shared sense of what we all can believe in and do believe in. And so, uh, you know, from the outset, it's important to understand those threats and the urgency when it might feel abstract, it might feel like we read headlines about disinformation, but we don't know how it affects each of us in our communities. And it's important to understand that when we do not know how to identify what is credible, when we question everything, which in many ways we should begin to, we often also don't know what other people are seeing. We don't know the kinds of truths or the basic principles that other people are basing their decisions on because each of us are being targeted in unique ways often. And it's incredibly hard to parse through what those types of content look like for each of us. We've also seen a rise in domestic actors who are peddling conspiracy theories. Those are actors here in the United States pushing any number of narratives that might be misleading or outright fabricated. And then there is this issue of micro-targeting, which sort of gets to my earlier point in which we really see all of us dividing, that there are these fault lines around the things we think of as real, the things we think of now as facts, as facts have become politicized, that the idea that we can each pick and choose the research studies, the headlines, whatever it is to fit an argument we believe because we are incredibly siloed. And so micro-targeting is a pretty dangerous phenomenon in which ads on sites like Facebook and other social media platforms are tailored for each of our potential behaviors, likes, dislikes, and our, our attitudes and rhetoric on those platforms. And what happens is if I am targeted with a certain ad, let's say, and others who are like me or display behaviors online like me, those types of ads might differ drastically from the things that my colleagues and my friends and my family see. So when I think about the questions that I am most moved by, the kinds of issues that I'm most worried about, I might be informed by a set of facts or stories and narratives different from those that my friends, my family, my colleagues are seeing when they go on social media. And then all of this comes together when we think about election day itself, because I don't want to lose sight of why we're doing these programs in earnest right now. And part of this is that on election day, our civic engagement is rooted in our constitution and we want everyone to have an equal playing field to exercise their rights. 
And so when it comes to election day disinformation, there are numerous, I would say countless examples in which misleading content may lead people to feel like the lines are too long in their polling location, when in fact they simply have not verified the video or the tweet or the account that they're reading. Any number of ways that people might simply not decide to vote and that disinformation can play a very real role in voter depression. And so the question we always ask at PEN America is, is this the new normal? And I worry that in many ways this is, that we have to find new and innovative ways to inoculate ourselves from the effect of disinformation, because it is not going anywhere. And so here's what we are seeing as we lead up to the 2020 election. This is from my colleagues at the NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. And it is just a small smattering of some of the ways that back in September of 2019, that is now one full year ago, we thought we would be seeing deep fake videos, tactics from both foreign and domestic actors, digital examples of voter suppression, uh, social media apps that are infiltrated with misleading narratives, such as WhatsApp scare tactics. These are all of the ways we anticipated seeing threats that might affect our election day and our electoral process. And so here's what we actually are now seeing, because it isn't just hard stop disinformation that affects communities. In the lead up to the election, there are questionable stories, there are misleading claims, there are outright fabricated headlines, and there are misattributed videos and images that make people think a certain thing. Here are just four pretty recurring issues that we are seeing from PEN America and from our expert uh, colleagues. One, we are seeing claims that mail-in ballots are color-coded to out voters and their party affiliation. This is something that originated in a small closed door Facebook group. So it was a community level group and an individual started promoting this, asking why different ballots in different counties were color coded in different ways. And of course, those types of issues all harken back to the way local officials uh, tabulate their votes in those specific counties. And so it's an incredibly difficult story or question to debunk because it really does vary county to county. And so when you think about what we might see this election season, that is a great example where it's not necessarily hard stop disinformation, but it's a questionable uh, story that will lead people to worry. And if they are worried enough, what will they do? They may not vote, they may think twice, they may worry they need to vote twice, they may decide any number of things. They may also share stories like this, which can then lead others in their social circles to think something else. We're also seeing claims around COVID and infection if and when you mail in your ballot. And this is, I would say, an even harder nut to crack because there are very legitimate public health concerns this election season. This election is going to be like no other election. And so as stewards or ambassadors of truth, part of what we hope librarians are able to do is make sense of the kinds of hotspots where people might turn to you and say, is this credible? Is this real? And what you need to be able to do is walk them through the ways that they can assess the veracity and the credibility of questions and stories they see online. Because when it comes to COVID, we are in a position where we want everyone to be exercising the utmost care and safety for themselves. And so we would never want to be in a position of trying to debunk infection stories or otherwise how infection and voting are related this season. We've also seen questions around Spanish language voters and claims that they cannot bring a translator into the ballot box. Um, just as Black voters were one of the most targeted demographics in the 2016 election, that is a point that the Senate uh, has underscored numerous times in its reporting on foreign interference. We are also seeing efforts now to target Latino and Spanish speaking voters this election season. And so these are the types of stories that you, again, want to be aware of and sensitive to, so that if you want to be hosting your own programs, if you want to be doing your own research into the credibility of these kinds of stories, you know how to start looking into them. And we'll get, be giving you those tools today. 
And then finally, there are relatively easier types of claims to debunk, which is that Democrats and Republicans vote on different days. Those are pretty easy ones. And as we get closer to election day, those are the types of hard stop pieces of fake content that we hope you'll really feel confident in conveying to your patrons and being sort of a point person to be able to point them in the direction of where they can find credible information about the electoral process. Here are just a few of the ways that we see misleading content play out right now. And as I preluded earlier, disinformation is but one significant definition. There is also misinformation, which is information shared simply in error or by mistake. But there are a rise now in imposter and fake news sites. We are also seeing misleading posts in private social media groups, kind of like I mentioned in our last slide, that claims around mail-in ballots being color-coded might out party affiliation of voters. That originated on a small private social media group and then proliferated and got more and more engagement. We're also, as always, seeing coordinated, inauthentic behavior. Those are the types of things that really increase and boost engagement on posts where you see something that has thousands of likes or comments potentially. And a lot of that can be due to bots. Those are automated and computer generated accounts. Trolls are often, uh, we, we think of troll farms, people sitting in big warehouses. They're real humans, but they're using these sort of pseudonymous accounts to increase engagement and traffic on certain posts. And then finally, we're seeing highly partisan or biased sites. And again, that is not hard stop disinformation. Those are the types of misleading narratives that make you question sort of your underlying principles and are often used to push voters to the furthest boundaries of our two parties so that people who might be in the center or center left are moving further left. And likewise, people center or center right are moving further right. And so you want to be able to start thinking about these issues and these types of misleading content as you think of how you will be engaging with your patrons this election season. So I think the question, right, is what can be done to fight disinformation? And what we have come up with over and over again is a kind of nuanced view that we cannot, as online users, and frankly, as a free expression organization, PEN America believes, we cannot simply abdicate all control to the platforms. Often some of their solutions to combat or moderate content actually have unintended consequences. That could include silencing or removing legitimate speech. And so in the mix, when we think about solutions, we have often proposed, and as far back as 2017 in our first report, Faking News, we proposed increasing and educating people about media literacy. And so what we said in that report was that empowered citizens are the ultimate solution to resolving the crisis of trust. There is this crisis right now. People don't believe what their reporters and editors are telling them. They often instead turn to trusted sources that they know about. Maybe it is a faith leader. Maybe it is a community leader. Maybe it is some other spokesperson or influencer on social media that they often go to. And we often now go to those places because we don't really believe what the news is telling us. And if we fundamentally have this breakdown in trust that we can't believe credible news and information, we have to bring people together with the news. And so part of what we're working on now is trying to help broker conversations where voters and members of the media can come together. But what else are we doing? Well, here's just a, a short teaser for you because we launched our Knowing the News program in early 2020. It is our media literacy flagship program. And we have a set of classic workshops that we uh, lead with partner organizations all over the country, trying to help educate and equip voters with the tools to identify misleading content. We also work with media partners, as I mentioned. We're trying to work with journalists and editors this election season. They're gonna have to make some really tough calls. And in the lead up to, and the day before, and then on election day, election night, and in the days that follow, we know that the media is going to have to think very critically about how it conveys election information and results to readers. And so that's gonna be a really critical piece of what we are doing this election season. 
And then finally, last but not least, we are working with librarians and educators. We believe that you are these ambassadors of truth, the places that people often go to and they implicitly and through knowledge and sort of through our shared passing down of the trust we bestow upon librarians, we often go to you for information and for facts. And so what we're doing are a series of trainings like this. We're doing uh, listening sessions and conversations and we're trying to help empower you to have the tools to lead sessions similar to this with your patrons and with members in your community. We want you to feel like you can adapt these types of resources. If you don't feel comfortable doing a full 60 or 90 minute workshop on Zoom, you might just want to put a flyer together of questions that readers and voters should be asking themselves. There are a number of ways that you can get involved this election season. And I want to give you just a little taste of why we so often come back to the critical role that librarians play. Because over and over and over again, leaders have reinforced that you are really the gatekeepers of truth and that libraries are uh, the banks of democracy. And so we hope that as you think through what your communities need and how you can get involved, that you feel like you can play a role in asserting and mapping out programs that matter. So what can you do? Well, you know, first I would say you're, you're doing a great job because you're here and that is number one. Learn about the threat of disinformation on our elections, on our society, and also try to learn about key election data information. I often think that, you know, democracy only whimpers away when we forget to register to vote, when we ultimately are working and we can't take time on election day to vote, or maybe we don't send our mail-in ballot in time to be counted. These are the types of really credible and nonpartisan ways that you can learn how to help empower and inform your communities. And then we always want to encourage you to host your own session. We will be providing the resources for you to do that. Um, and we just, we want you to feel ready if you want to ask us questions. That is part of what PEN America is here for. And then finally, we want you to know what to expect on election day itself and where to point voters for credible information. And frankly, what I call expectation setting. We will not have election results in many of our races on election night. And so we're going to be dealing with a delay in the process. And I think it's important for important and critical sort of those, those gatekeepers like you, like reporters, like other community leaders to help set those expectations for your communities. That delays in the election this time are not necessarily a sign of something being rigged or of chaos. There will be absolutely more mail-in ballots this election season because of the pandemic. And as election officials are doing their job, it will take them longer. And we want communities, we want voters in that period after the election day to not turn to somehow misleading information because they fall prey to it and they are concerned. We want them to be able to know where to turn. And that includes knowing to turn to you. So when you're conveying information before November 3rd to your communities, one of the things you wanna be able to convey is this necessary delay that we will be facing. And as we wait, our expression is truth takes time. And we will be waiting and we will be reading credible information and we will be thinking carefully about our headlines. And as communities and voters do that, we know that they will be looking to you. So, here are some of the ways that we're gonna be preparing you. We're uh, 25 minutes into our 60 minutes together. And I hope that this so far has given you at least a, a taste of the important role of librarians, the ways that you can think about your position now in your community. And here's how we wanna prepare you to host your own session this election season. First, we want you to know the basics of disinformation. And we're gonna go through our basic toolkit with you now. We also then wanna give you the basics of media literacy and how to use it to spot and stop the spread of disinformation. And as I've repeated a few times, after this training, you will receive a toolkit with these resources. So you may refer back to them at your leisure. You can adapt them as you choose. And we want you to feel like you can take time to do a deeper dive into all of this. 
not everything in this full hour will be everything you need. And so we want to make sure that you have additional resources as you prepare to host your own session. So what are the basics of disinformation? I think it really begins with a question of how disinformation works and why we're susceptible to it. You know, it's always been a phenomenon, and I mean throughout the ages. We have seen examples of propaganda throughout history. We have seen in early America, we have seen American journalism rife with lies, exaggerations, mudslinging at political candidates. And it really wasn't until hallmarks and standards around credible journalism uh, became something that journalists and the media centered themselves on that there really was any kind of consensus around these issues here in the US. But as something that has long proliferated, I believe that, again, the digital age has made it all the more easy for disinformation to proliferate and to do so very rapidly. I think one of the ways is that it plays on our emotions. So often, if we see a headline, think about your own experience. What do you feel when you see something incendiary or that makes you angry or anxious or afraid or maybe just excited and passionate? Something could be an evocative image. And when that happens, our guards are down, we will be moved to take action usually. And when we see something that makes us feel emotional, Often disinformation has what I call a credibility, a kind of patina or kernel of truth to it, where you, you see something, it could be a headline and then an article. It also could be a video that has been perhaps spliced together or manipulated. Either way, it feels real. And so you, you just continue in that emotional state to digest what you're seeing. And you are not questioning what you're seeing, why you're seeing it, or what it really is, you know, where it originated, the source of uh, an article or otherwise. And then there are bots, which I've mentioned a little bit. You know, when you see something, let's say on social media, that has been promoted by computer generated accounts, and there are a lot of likes, a lot of comments, a lot of engagement on a post, I'm going to admit to you that when that happens to me, I want to get in on the action. I say, oh, well, this must be important. What is it? I want to get in and I want to share it right now. And that feeling, the need for that dopamine fix, you know, when you share something and then people start liking it and what you're doing is you're sharing something news and groundbreaking perhaps, that's really the moment that Pen America always wants to reach people at. And as ambassadors of truth, we think librarians can help slow people down. So when people have emotions, when they don't question or think critically of what they're seeing, and they're just wanting to share, wanting to engage in something, that's the moment where you also can step in and say, well, wait, 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 let's slow down and think about what we are seeing. And then there are a few other ways that disinformation works. And I wanna just go forward to explain what the illusory truth effect is. The illusory truth effect is something that's been researched since about the 1970s. Uh, it's almost like a shortcut in our brains that once we see something, we see it again, we're more likely to believe it. And the more we encounter something, the more we're likely to somehow think it's real. Um, researchers recently did a study and they said every time a lie is repeated, it appears slightly more plausible. Uh, and so late in 2016, this research study, for example, focused on Facebook users. And researchers showed Facebook users real credible headlines and then fake headlines. And as people were shown those headlines, they were told by the researchers which ones were real and which ones were false. And then they were distracted and spoke with the researchers some more. And then the researchers did a second round of showing users these headlines, adding in some new ones and mixing up the order. And Either way, when users saw a headline a second time, they were more likely to say that it was real and credible. And it really is that when we see something, we just can't help it. And so when we see things online, even when they might be called out, debunked, fact-checked, whatever, we're often more likely to believe it the second time, even when it has been fact-checked. 
it's incredibly hard to rewire our brains to be able to do the hard work of not automatically going on that what, what, what we call autopilot and just believing what we see. And part of that plays into the final piece of how disinformation works, which is confirmation bias. That often we, we like what we already believe and we seek it out. And so when we see information that confirms our views, maybe even further takes us into a more partisan or biased realm, we tend to believe it. And so taken together, all of that makes us susceptible to the spread of disinformation. And it makes us want to get involved. It makes us want to be in the mix. Here is just one example that even when Facebook has tried to put little disputed by third party fact checker notifications on their platform, it's been met with really mixed results. It's really hard to counter the spread. And so one of our questions is always, well, first we need to understand what are the phases of disinformation? And so I'm only going to use for the sake of time, an example from 2016, from the most engaged post from the 2016 election. It was an article that in headlines said that the Pope endorsed Donald Trump for president. It was shared over a million times. I'm sorry, it was shared, liked, or engaged with over a million times. And part of what researchers found um, was that, you know, first the article had to be conceived of. Someone somewhere had to think of this story. And so they conceived of the idea of it. What's interesting is that this specific story though is based on a real interview with the Pope. In real life, the Pope was interviewed and not about this. He was interviewed about the likelihood of the FBI reaching Hillary Clinton's emails. During that interview, he mentioned both of the presidential candidates by name, who were Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And when he mentioned them, he was explaining things about both candidates. And so what's interesting is that whoever conceived of this took a real article with a patina of credibility and cut it, spliced the quote together to create a headline that the Pope had endorsed one of the candidates and not the other. And then the article was published on a news site, part of a network of fabricated news sites. And I'm gonna to talk to you just a little bit about that as well, that we are seeing a rise in what we call pink slime or fake news websites. And so the article was posted and then it was shared on social media. Until it was shared on social media, it was only published across all of the networks of these fake news websites. Once it was shared on social media, shared by someone a part of this network, then it was shared again and shared again and shared again. And maybe it was shared by, for example, people who were supporting one candidate, and maybe it was then shared by people who supported another candidate. Either way, it became one of the most engaged with posts, the most engaged post of the 2016 election regarding election news. And what's interesting is that once everyday people started sharing it, they weren't sharing it as disinformation. What happened? It became misinformation. Because so many people, they didn't have an intent to deceive, though I believe that the creation of this article was intended to kind of deceive the public. And so once you or me share something usually, we have the power to actually be content creators. We're almost like publishers. And if we have that power, we need to then exercise it and be able to be judicious and responsible in what we are choosing to share and give oxygen to. So here is what the very short basics are of how we convey our media literacy toolkit. Because we want to always empower people. We don't want people to continue doing that kind of autopilot, passive reading, scanning of their social media feed. And we think it's really important to start with one single question of taking control of your digital experience, asking yourselves how and where you consume information. We have to say, I have to say, you know, we're online more than ever. With the pandemic, we are also many of us working at home. We are then in front of our laptops and our phones, our tablets, our kids are on our tablets and computers more than ever. And so how do you consume information? And as librarians and educators, you should begin asking your patrons how they consume information. I remember when I used to go to the physical library and I would look up books 
in person. And then that was how I researched things when I did reports for school. I don't really believe that everyone now does that. And certainly if you are going to Wikipedia or Google, or what if you're going to Facebook, what if you're going to Twitter or TikTok, so many people, a majority of Americans actually, are now using social media as the gateway to news. So here are some of the places that you can consider asking your patrons. Where do you receive news? Maybe it's articles, op-eds. Maybe it's links in social media to articles, which is how so many Americans now see content. It could be ads that you see a lot and then you click to something, or talk radio or other radio or television and news broadcasting. Excellent questions to ask your constituents. Here is just a brief primer on what Pew Research Center has said, which is a study from 2019, which found that 71% of American adults are using Facebook as a pathway to news. So when you or I share something, perhaps, remember, we're all publishers now. When you or I share something on our Facebook, 71% of Americans are then using those types of friend, colleague, and social network posts to get information. 52% are using Facebook, for example, as a news site. And it is not a news site. It is a social connector. And we have to try to help people understand where to turn beyond just Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. And so the second thing that we advise is to question your reactions to what you see. You know, think back to the way disinformation works that it plays on our emotions. And frankly, what I always say is don't take the bait. If you feel really emotional, you should take a moment, pause. Ask yourself why you feel that way. The first thing that I always want when I feel emotional is to share. And we have to disavow ourselves of those types of practices. We really have to take control of our experience online and begin curating and really thinking carefully about what we see. And so we want you to be careful and we want you to convey to your patrons how disinformation thrives because it thrives on engagement. The third thing is to question really not just what you're seeing and your reactions, but well, what are you actually seeing? Are you seeing news? Are you seeing a video that a friend shared? Are you seeing an opinion? from someone who is a pundit on Twitter, just pontificating. Sometimes all of the array of content that we ultimately are digesting, we're not really thinking about. And so you wanna be able to help your patrons and other constituents make those distinctions. In doing so, it really leads me to, I think my very favorite of all of our tips, which is check the credibility of the source. And there are a few ways that you can do that, but for example, the Denver Guardian may sound like a legitimate news site. So will the Chesapeake Bay Times or the local Gazette. And you may hear people saying, oh, well, I found that on, on this web page, this news uh, website, it's encouraging people to vote twice. And those are the types of opportunities where you can then pivot and say, well, part of what we want you to be able to do is know how to check the credibility of something. So a really easy way to begin is to click about us on unfamiliar sites. Oftentimes when those are bad sites, you know, junk websites, fake, uh, fake news or pink slime sites, those will not have any information that's of use. And really credible news organizations will. They will have their policies, both their transparency, their mistakes and corrections policies, their ethics policies. They'll have a range of pieces that provide more insight into the outlet. And so here are some of the hallmarks that I often encourage people to look for when they're trying to ascertain the credibility and the trustworthiness of news sites. Some of this is around the ethics, some is around the quality, and then others is the standards of reporting. And that not all of these will always be visible or evident in a single article. But generally, journalists are pursuing truth. They are always trying to pursue facts and investigating for accuracy in their reporting. That will include seeking out a variety of opinions. It will include citing to sources. 
It will include thorough fact checking and when and if there are mistakes, credible news organizations retract, apologize, and they correct their mistakes. Those will happen quickly. And so these are just some of the ways that you can think of ways to help inform your constituents of what the hallmarks are when they ask, well, how do I tell what is a real news site and what is not a real news site? So these are just some of the ways. And then finally, number five, if you're gonna share anything, if you are going to allow or encourage others to share anything, our number one recommendation is to fact check what you are reading. So how do you do this? Well, one, run it through Google. If you don't feel ready to do anything more than that, you can take the search terms from a headline and put them into Google. You can also then add terms like true or false or hoax. And while you add those, sometimes the search results may come up with existing fact checking websites, which I'll show you. Those include Snopes, PolitiFact, Washington Post has a fact checker. Sometimes those fact checking websites will do the work for you. Sometimes they won't because they maybe didn't already fact check an article or a video. And so you want to make sure that if you are really committed to understanding and pursuing the credibility of sources before you share that it does come with time. It takes time to verify. Uh, some of my colleagues at the Denver Public Library have told me that in their pursuit of really figuring out what the origins of something are, that it's taken them upwards of an hour to just find out where a, a photo came from. So as librarians, you have the tools, you have the time to be able to do that. Some of your patrons may not. And so you want to give them some of the quickest ways to get information and credible fact checking. And frankly, this really like quick and dirty version is run something through Google and add one of these terms, true, false, or hoax, and see what comes up. What about images and videos or sources? Because I have to admit, one of the biggest concerns I have in the lead up to this election is the way that images and videos will move all of us. Let's say on election day, you see a video on your Twitter feed of what is supposedly your polling location that has closed. And without thinking about it, you just decide not to vote. Or you know people who then think that their polling location really has closed. What we always encourage people do is to verify images and videos by first con considering the year, the place, and the source. I mean, this is a nonpartisan and non-election example. Swans in the Venice Canal. This was an image that percolated online when the pandemic hit here in the United States. And part of what was being said was, uh, I don't really think a, a horribly uh, misleading narrative meant to deceive people, but people said swans were swimming in the Venice canals because people were at home and that nature and animals were thriving. And I was so moved personally by this story that I wanted to share it on social media. And I thought to myself, that's just too good to be true. It's just too gorgeous, that image. So I did some, some research, some homework, and I found out that swans are always swimming in the Venice canals. This was not because of the pandemic. They are just not swimming typically where tourists go. And that they swim in this small little northern area of the Venice canals. And the image was taken out of context. It was given a caption that made me believe something that was not accurate. And so in the lead up to the election, if you see images, people photographing their mail-in ballot being tampered with, that's a great example. You can ask and pursue questions around, well, what is the year? What is the place? Has this been taken out of context? And a great resource that we will share when we follow up with you is First Draft has a pocket guide on how to verify videos. Videos are really their own beast. And we want you to feel like you have all of the ways and the tools to be able to verify them. Another one is how to verify accounts. There will be a, surely I believe, there will be a rise in fake and misleading and uncredi uh, uncredible uh, social media accounts. Here is an example. On the left, there is a Twitter account from Rashida Tlaib. She is a member of Congress, but there's no blue check mark next to her name. And if you really look, the L in her last name is actually a capital I. 
it is a fake account. It recently joined back uh, in January of 2019, posting this incredibly incendiary post, and it was done to lead people to believe a certain thing. And so we want you, we want your constituents to not fall prey to that. In the same breath, there are ways that there might, get, there might be fake email accounts created, bogus Gmail accounts created to entice people to vote somewhere else or to say, you're not registered or to say, you need to register in this county. We don't even know, we can't imagine the breadth of ways that bad actors might try to reach voters to depress turnout. Back when there were protests this summer in the wake of George Floyd's killing, this was an activist who posted from Atlanta talking about a fake and bogus email account sending people to a protest that wasn't real. So BLM at gmail.com was not a credible new, uh, Gmail account. And in fact, part of what she was trying to do was call out where the credible information was. So if you do have social media accounts, if your libraries have social media accounts, think about the ways that they may be able to share credible nonpartisan information. That includes places like election protection. It includes your state secretary of state website. It includes local and state election board websites. The local ones will be really, really critical as you wait for election results and as your patrons do. Here is just a smattering of fact-checking resources that I often support. And I think that together, these are really great resources. I also encourage people to check all of them out. Don't just believe me. Part of what we're trying to help you do is feel confident in empowering yourselves empowering your communities to really take control of their experience. And one of the ongoing questions I get is, well, what do you think of, you know, PolitiFact over Snopes? And I say, I have my opinion, but what is yours? Investigate yourself, do the homework. I think together, all of these provide a really great and well-rounded set of fact-checking resources. And I want to just flag as I'm closing and I want to make sure we have 10 minutes for questions. I want to flag what additional resources there are. And I, I just preluded just now a little bit about places like election protection and otherwise. I would point you to the ALA's libraries and voter engagement guide. It is a fantastic guide. We will be including it in our resource packet for you. It has tremendous resources around where to turn and how to point voters to credible sites for the electoral process. It also has some creative ideas for programming that you can lead. And we want you, we encourage you, we empower you to host your own session. And so part of what the ALA's guide will do is lay out all of the ways you can do something. It might be a flyer. It might be hosting a convening of some sort. It might be something else but we want you to feel like you can. And so we want to give you the tools and the checklist to feel like you can do that. Penn has a number of, uh, a number of tools. Let me start with our recorded trainings. This is a, a wonderful set of resources on our website, which we will be including in our follow-up to you. We have trainings from previous train the trainers with librarians. We have, um, recorded trainings for voters. We have them on discrete topics. So during the summer when we saw a rise in protest disinformation, we held a really targeted training on protest disinformation. Next week, we're gonna be hosting the first ever webinar for first time and young voters. That's gonna be a great opportunity for people who don't know what they need to know about the electoral process and how disinformation is playing a role this election season. So all of our trainings are on our website, the Knowing the News webpage. We also then have really short form tip sheets. These are the kinds of guides that will allow you to just dip your toe in these different topics, whether it is COVID disinformation, maybe it is a primer on how to talk to people who share misinformation online or otherwise. And then, of course, we have the train the trainer resources, which we will be sending you. And then uh, the last is research your officials where you live and work. Research the local Board of Elections website. Know the deadlines in your community and in your state. That will include deadlines around when people need to register to vote, when they need to confirm that their registration status is good, 
Maybe they need to mail in their ballot by a certain date in your state. Know those deadlines, communicate them to your constituents. And so I just wanna close with a few notes. One, we hope you'll stay in touch with PEN America. You can follow us on Twitter. You will also be prompted when you finish this workshop to take our post-workshop survey. And I hope you will do that because it's useful for us as we adapt and always try to make better our curriculum. You will, as I've reiterated, get our Train the Trainer toolkit after the training. And if you are watching this recording after the fact, please email medialiteracy at pen.org and we will send you the toolkit. I want to take a moment and thank our partners today because the LA Public Library has been a fantastic partner of ours, opening up space and encouraging their librarians to attend today. We have over 200 of you here with us. And I don't think everyone is from the LA Public Library, but I am completely biased. I am from Los Angeles, so I have a very special place in my heart for the LA Public Library. I used to go there all the time as a kid. Um, and so I just wanna thank you guys so much as a partner. You've been tremendous. Uh, we now have about eight minutes, but I can stay an extra couple if others can, and I will take questions in the Q&A function. I'm going to stop sharing, but I just want to remind all of you that you will get various resources, you will get our toolkit, we hope you'll take our post-workshop survey, and thank you so much. Now, there are, there's a lot in the chat, but I'm going to start with the Q&A. So let's see, this is from someone saying, how do we counter the message or expectation of an election day winner when that message is coming from the White House, not a foreign actor or troll? Excellent question. <sighs> Deep breath. This is part of what we're working on at PEN America. We are working with our media partners, trying to help train them and think critically and frankly scenario plan for how they are going to cover that. Um, I think this is something that we should anticipate that there very well may be a call from someone on election night that they have won the election. And the question is, how will you and how will journalists and editors work with that? Um, I think we need to wait for different calls from the media. But if one media outlet calls the election, that will then call into question or set a precedent for others to be sort of questioned why they are not. And so this is really something that I think turns to you being able to be an arbiter of difficult conversations with your patrons, because you're going to have to counter the message. You're going to have to say, you know, what are the types of biases that different candidates have? What are the types of issues that we are seeing at play and who benefits from calling an election night when election results have not come through. One of the best and most data-driven ways you can counter something like this is by walking people through the tabulation process. So there is sort of the emotional human aspect, right, that I just mentioned, that you want to really hear people, hear their concerns, and talk about the partisanship of that. But then you also want to walk people through just the brass tacks of what election officials are doing. A lot of races, local and state, as well as federal, may not have results available on election night. I do not think that we will have a presidential election result on election night. The candidate for president will not be chosen. And so while a variety of uh, local officials are working hard, there are also ways that the AP is involved in this process. And so it's important to understand that process. We are going to be releasing another tip sheet for you and for voters on what to expect around these issues and how the AP is involved and how the news media is going to be calling these races. And that's going to be a really credible source. We are, of course, nonpartisan at PEN America. We have thought carefully about these questions and what voters can expect. And so it's not so much about countering a message as setting expectations now. So uh, I think it's a wonderful question. And I'm always happy you know, to dig deeper as we approach Election Day. It is a topic that we will be talking about in every single training of ours. And the notion that we must wait that truth takes time. 
Another question, can we acknowledge that a powerful and unprecedented source of disinformation, particularly around the upcoming election, is the President of the United States? I think that is an excellent question, speaks in many ways to the question that was just asked as well. And in your programming, um, I hope that you will also try to use a nonpartisan voice, that you will ground the messaging that you provide your patrons in data and in evidence and in the tabulation process. Because if there are certain arbiters or vectors of disinformation at play here, we want to be able to flood the zone with credible information. We want to be able to point people to what could be a counter narrative to this. And the counter narrative is that a delay actually is happening because votes are still being counted. They will continue being counted through election day and night. Someone asked, what can we do when people we engage with have given up on believing the media or journalists? because they find them too biased or opinionated rather than factual and objective. We talk a little bit about this um, in our longer training sessions. Today was a very condensed 60 minute session. Typically our trainings are more 90 minute sessions. Uh, but I think the question around objectivity is a really useful one. There have recently been calls especially in light of the George Floyd protests and the coverage around those uh, led by black journalists to question what the role of objectivity means. How can journalists call out injustice perhaps and be doing so in ways that are still grounded in facts and um, while perhaps making uh, some kind of opinion known, how can they do so in ways that actually help move the needle or shift narratives? This really arose because questions uh, came up around how the media was covering protests this summer. And so what can we do when we think about how people have given up? I think one of the ways is bring people together with journalists over the you know, next month and a half and maybe after the election. Think about the role that you can play, the kind of connective tissue where you can start researching who the local editors and journalists are in your community and inviting them to come meet constituents. One of the things we are doing at PEN America now is holding a series of journalist convenings. These are convenings, uh, we're doing one next week, for example, that explores objectivity and the role of reporters during election season in the Rust Belt. Everyone is welcome. It's not just for Rust Belt viewers, but we're trying to really target and think about regions that are going to be at play this election season. And so we want to pursue those questions. And the truth is, we want to connect voters and readers and communities to journalists. We want to help break down the distrust, the miseducation, and the way people are simply not informed about how the news gets made. And when people are given the opportunity to learn about that, we've actually seen a tremendous opportunity where people often reflect, I didn't know that that's what an editor considers when they're weighing headlines to run or crafting a headline. And so these are really exciting opportunities we're seeing. And as we do more and more of these, we're doing both kind of formal convenings. We're also doing listening sessions with communities about what they wanna see in their news. And so I encourage you to attend one of our workshops on with journalists and then stay tuned for more after the election, because that is a question that will not end or lose its urgency after November 3rd. How do you deal with people who find the concept of fact checking political and don't trust independent sources. Well, uh, this is adjacent to a question I get all the time and I would say, you know, the number one theme that we always get asked is just how do you deal with people that might not see reason or might not trust sources when you share them. And so I think uh, one, I want to point you and we will be sharing after this training, uh, election guide that we put together because of that number one question we have been asked. It is a tip sheet on how to talk to friends and family who share misinformation. So I would encourage you to check that out because we explore and have done over a dozen convenings with voters and members of the public to really try to understand how they communicate with their friends and family, what they're worried about. And I think one of the underlying issues here is to understand when you should avoid uh, escalation 
and how to know when to have an exit strategy. Sometimes you may be the most wonderful stopgap for others. If someone has shared something and it's misleading, or if you're trying to really debate um, in a nuanced way with people about what they are considering news and credible, that could go really well. It could take a while, but those are ongoing discussions. And as you have them, you may see people, you could see the wheels turning where suddenly someone might think twice about video captions, or maybe they'll just think a little bit more about why am I seeing this and why am I emotional? But there is always the possibility that things will not go well. And someone may actually just be combative when you try to confront them and talk with them. And that's when you need to understand that realistically, you're not gonna win everyone over. And you have to be able to know that and provide credible sources to them, be a credible source for them, and then have an exit strategy. Um, because we just will not be able to change the hearts and minds of everyone. I think this is just because of time going to be my last question, but there are a number of questions here. And I, I just want to sort of reiterate that we are available. And when we email you uh, with our train the trainer toolkit, I really want you to be sure that if you have questions, please write us back. All we want is to be able to spark community with you and be able to do that by hearing what you're thinking about in the programming that you are doing. So uh, one question is, how do we deal with even historically trusted sources like the CDC being arguably politicized and used to put out disinformation? Excellent question. We often get this one. And so I wanted to address it because part of the problem now is that in our political climate, facts and science have been politicized. And we need to reorient and recast that narrative, that science should not be a political issue, that facts and that data are not political, but they have become so. And so that's the world we live in now. And part of what we need to be able to do in inoculating people, in making people really think more carefully about what they're seeing online is we need to empower people to understand what their digital practices are. So, we're not gonna win over necessarily all leaders or all spokespeople or all influencers. Not everyone is going to suddenly think twice before they publish something on their social media account. But if you can flood the zone, if you can be someone that's really thoughtful and say, I spent time fact checking this, here are the set of fact checking resources I use, here is the you know, set of questions I ask myself, here are ways to verify videos, images, whatever. Those are the ways that you can actually help reorient the conversation. And for people who are learning these types of issues, I have to say in my own personal life, my friends and family, bless them, whenever they share anything with me now, they say to me, either I made sure to fact check this, or they say, don't get mad, I didn't fact check this yet, but isn't it interesting? And I actually think that that's a really powerful first step, that people are even beginning to think that the things online that we see and we read we might fall for. And in telling me, oh, I fact check this, or even, oh, I didn't fact check it, they're aware that there is this additional layer of work we're gonna have to do. So we can't change everything, but what we can do is start thinking critically about our own sources. And for those that are scientists, that those public health officials that are being muzzled, this is a sign of the times. And unfortunately, it's a situation that we cannot all change individually, but we can each try to change the ecosystem that we are living in online. Uh, I want to thank you all. I want to let you know that you can promote this training. You can promote other trainings and our upcoming webinar for first time voters to your constituents. You should be attending that next Wednesday. You can attend our journalist series on trust in the Rust Belt. Please attend every and all of the workshops that we are doing. I hope that when you sign out today, you will fill out our post-workshop survey. And please stay tuned for our follow-up email with our Train the Trainer Toolkit and other ideas to get you going. Thank you all so much for being here.